for coming out on a Sunday afternoon, a beautiful day in Washington. And um, the argument behind this book is that the beguiling personality of New Orleans is the result of a long tension between a culture of spectacle rooted in the dances of enslaved Africans uh, at a public park called Congo Square and a city of laws that for much of our history was anchored in white supremacy and uh, in later years, even after the civil rights rulings of the 1960s, has sadly veered toward lawlessness. Um, in the manner of the ancient Greeks, I will now pass over the former mayor of the city after Hurricane Katrina, who now holds an endowed chair in a federal penitentiary. Um, I am so grateful to Politics and Prose for hosting me. And uh, in the one hour uh, that I have allotted, I'm going to use uh, the first half hour or so to talk about the book. And then I'm going to show a seven minute uh, clip from a film that <laughs> has only taken about half my life and is now finally in post production. It too is called City of a Million Dreams. Uh, and I suppose I should begin by giving a little background on how these overlapping projects came to be. Uh, you know, when you, when you grow up in a place where the grown-ups wear masks and dance in the streets during carnival time, it, it plants a certain optimism for the human experiment. And it's especially helpful to have that sensibility at certain periods of national darkness such as we're in right now. I had no idea when I moved into the home stretch in writing this book several years ago that it would come out uh, when it did in uh, just a couple of months ago with the whole idea of democracy sort of up for grabs. And the argument of this book about the collision between culture and law plays itself out uh, in a character uh, driven narrative and in a sense this book has a happy ending because 13 years after New Orleans all but drowned on international television suffering uh, the worst calamity uh, at least in terms of flooding that the city uh, had ever experienced uh, with Hurricane Katrina today it is a robust city still with problems, as most of them have, but it has uh, had miles of infrastructure repair. It is culturally uh, in the middle of a remarkable rebirth, not just with the music uh, in a beautiful resurgence, but a flourishing literary community. And it is becoming a city of the young, magnetizing young professionals from other places to come to a place where the idea of the place was an open uh, question for several years uh, after the storm. So the idea for this book came from my curiosity about jazz funerals. I began um, interviewing musicians because I was curious. I, I wanted to know how jazz funerals began, what explains this ritual that in some ways is so beautiful with the brass band players intoning these sad, somber, rolling dirges as they take the body from the church to the cemetery. And then after the interment and the final words, quite often, remember thou art dust, to dust thou shalt return. At that point, the band leaving the graveyard launches into the up-tempo, high-kicking music which magnetizes street dancers known as the second line or second liners, many of whom never knew the dead guy, and they dance in the street to this uplifting music. And it struck me, even at the tender age of, I guess, 24, when I followed my first one, as something of a mystery. Because on the one hand, the band almost has the role of a Greek chorus singing to the community the cosmos has been broken. Someone important has died. And then within a few minutes, all of these people are dancing uh, as if no one ever died, but they're celebrating the release of the soul, uh, the cutting loose, as the musicians call it. And I was curious, 
My curiosity was doubled by the fact that uh, in the early 1990s, uh, there was a pronounced shift in the body language and the sort of visual uh, poetry of these uh, street dances. Uh, a more fiery way of dancing, people, some people taking off their shirts, spewing beer. This was happening for funerals of kids who were killed in the crack wars. And of course the drug epidemic was nationwide. Different cities tell their stories in different ways. And these funerals for the young drug victims were so arresting to look at. And I began interviewing several of the mainstream musicians, Milton Batiste, who was a trumpeter with the Olympia Brass Band, uh, Harold Dejan, the founder of the uh, Olympia Band, Michael White, who's a key figure in this book toward the end, um, a clarinetist known for playing the widow's wail, the, the pealing sound of sorrow that the dark reed instrument carries at these uh, processions. And they were all complaining about the spirituality of this ritual being ripped out by the wildness of these funerals. So that's sort of what set me on the road that eventually culminated in this book and soon the companion film. I got some support from the Ford Foundation. I interviewed musicians on camera, a project with the Jazz Archive at Tulane. And uh, I even filmed uh, several funerals. I should pause for a moment and say that the, sto the story of my life since then has been a series of long interval intervals where I, I went off writing about the Catholic Church and the crisis, which I've chronicled for about 30 years now. And every time I would come back, pardon me, from one of those assignments, I would go to a funeral. And the city was giving me a sense of joy at a time when I was experiencing a tremendous darkness in uncovering the stories that I was writing about and eventually the several three books that I did and uh, a couple of film documentaries. So, so this New Orleans project kept like a magnet pulling at me. And when I finally got to the point where I could organize my life and the work and put in the final stretch, I had learned in all the reading I had done that the story of the funerals really begins with the story of the city and that the two are sort of inseparable. Um, as I say, the argument of the book is the steady tension, the collision between culture and law. The founder of New Orleans, Bienville, uh, a French nobleman from Canada, a uh, minor nobility, Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, Sieur de Bienville, he was the the 12th uh, son of the wealthiest man in Canada at that time who bought landed titles for each of his sons as they came of age by paying Louis XIV who kept needing to replenish his coffers because of the war debts. And at one point Count Punchatrain, indeed the man for whom the Great Lake out on the edge of New Orleans is named, said to him, Your Majesty, every time you create a title some fool is there to buy it. So, you know, money and politics are an old story, even when you deal with monarchy. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that really struck me about Bienville was that his body was covered with snake tattoos. I learned this reading a journal uh, of a French admiral that had been translated and published by the Museum of Mobile, Alabama, where the early French colony had its outpost before the city was founded in 1718. And when I saw that, the first thing I thought of was the only known image of Bienville, which is of a European gentleman in a fine shirt. It, it, it is done in his mid-60s after he has left New Orleans, retired, gone back to spend his later years in France. His last 30 years, by the way, are a complete blank. No one that I'm aware of in French scholarship has been able to piece together what exactly he did, although we do have uh, an account of his will and what he left to whom. He never married. So here is Bienville in this picture pointing out 
as if to a distant world. It's a, it's a trope of the uh, pintorial style, the portrait style of the times. And his shirt, of course, is not open, so you can't see what today people call body art emblazed upon his body. But to me, at the very beginning, here is a man who covers himself in serpents to say to the Indians, I can fight as fiercely as you, now let's do business. The whole idea of spectacle is written across his body. When you, when you follow the early history of New Orleans, it's striking how many parades of Native Americans weave through these annals in just sort of sinuous lines because they had to keep the peace and, in, and to do so, the whole idea of dancing and celebrating that was central to the Native American presence was something that what we today would call diplomacy had to adjust to, had to adapt to. And so you find Bienville, a quick study on the Indian dialects, learning what people were saying, being able to communicate with them, needing Indians to anchor the food chain, and at the same time taking the battle out to the exterior, fighting the Chickasaw, who were quite a slave trading um, nation in North Mississippi. And eventually when he goes back uh, the final time at the age of 62, he's worn out, he can't really fight anymore, he's tired, but he has created a city against all odds after fighting with the early French bureaucrats over where to put it. New Orleans is where it is today by the sheer force of Bienville's personality. If I sound a bit like someone who is uh, resurrecting the old great man or great person of history theory, uh, I won't plead the fifth, but I will say that I wanted to write a history in which dynamic, three-dimensional people carry the story chapter by chapter. Uh, there are any number of eminent works of history that deal with documents that bring to life an age by its economics, by its philosophy, by, by its religious currents. I wanted to understand the place where I'm from and I figured the best way to do that was to understand what it was like, what the daily life was like for people across the first three centuries. And the short answer is that it was rough. There were horrendous uh, diseases that kept uh, reducing the population. Uh, yellow fever, of course, was one of the scourges that m moves across the 19th century almost like some serpent ready, ready to strike. Of all the people who, who gets to the edge and kind of looks into the abyss of this period of time, the one who really attracted me was Benjamin Latrobe. Benjamin Latrobe uh, comes from England. He's a classically educated architect. He was really the first, what you might call, master builder, uh, both an architect an engineer, a builder. Uh, he had a lucrative contract repairing the capital uh, after uh, the British invaded in 1812 and parts of Washington burned. And he is in a meeting uh, with President Madison and a, a bureaucrat to whom he reports uh, discussing the progress that they're making. And he gets a letter right before he goes in telling him that his son Henry who is just in his uh, mid-twenties and has gone to New Orleans to establish a waterworks, which the city desperately needed, which most cities needed in the early 19th century, to uh, secure water cleanliness to reduce the diseases like cholera, uh, like uh, yellow fever, that had such an impact uh, on the population at that time. So he gets a letter telling him his son has died. And reading the biography, you don't even have to go much between the lines. It's apparent that he was furious. He had lost his son. This son was the younger of the two children he had in England when his wife died young, and he himself had a nervous breakdown. After he recovered, he left these two children in England, moved to America, 
established himself in Washington, then in Philadelphia, which is where the government was at that time, and marries a, um, a patrician, a woman from a, an, an old uh, mainline family, and then brings the children over. And uh, he and his wife uh, had uh, three children uh, after that. So this is a man who has been an entrepreneur, I guess you'd say, before the term was coined. And he's in this meeting. He's suddenly angry, and he lashes out at this uh, bureaucrat he's working with who is stymieing him in what he wants to do. And Madison, who by all accounts was not the cheeriest personality on the map at the time, says to him, do you know who I am, sir? And he turns to him and says, indeed, I do. And then there's a, a long paragraph that I quote in which he says, I think that I have the talent to do everything that is needed to be done. And it's a, it's a peroration. It's, a, it's a, this declamatory defense of himself, at which moment he realizes that he has just blown it. He's exploded. Maybe he didn't understand why he was so angry, but at the end of the speech he gives, his job is up. <laughs> and so he leaves, bankruptcy stalking him like a shadow in the sun. He takes the, bone, the boat down to New Orleans, and when he gets there, this is when his psyche, if you will, really comes alive. The book he did is called Impressions Respecting New Orleans, and it is, in my view, a, a true classic, and I've even suggested to certain members of the publishing world that the book uh, be reprinted. Let me see. Well, what page are we on? 15. Pardon me. This would normally be a word, time for a word from our sponsors. Um, January 12, 1819. He's on the boat. The family is back in Philadelphia. He's got all these personal issues welling inside of him. And the fog is so thick, they cannot see the dock where present day uh, Jackson Square is. Then it was known as Place d'Armes. A sound more strange than any that is heard anywhere else in the world, he writes in his journal. A more incessant, loud, and various gabble of tongues of all tones than was ever heard at Babel from the voices of the market people and their customers. So here you have a man who hears the city before he sees it. And then when he arrives, he is stunned by the collection of peoples that are before him. All hues of brown, all classes of faces from round Yankees, to grizzly and lean Spaniards, black Negroes and Negresses, filthy Indians half naked, mulattoes, curly and straight haired, quarteroons of all shades, long haired and frizzled, the women dressed in the most flaring yellow and scarlet gowns, the men capped and hatted. Well, by this time, by 1819, New Orleans has gone from a long period as a French colony, then uh, in 1763, Spain acquired it from France, and over the next generation, the Spanish literally rebuilt the city. The French Quarter that we know today was uh, built by the Spanish um, after the great fire of 1788 when the city had to expand. And it did so opening up like the, the slow unfolding of a lady's fan. Throughout this colonial growth, there was a powerful tide of spirituality that was coursing against what you might call the conventional psychology of building a city. And that was the presence of African people and the Sunday dances at a place called Congo Square where the slaves revived burial choreographies of the mother culture, dancing in rings, sometimes concentric circles, rings within rings, moving in counterclockwise shuffles against the rotation of the sun all of this a transplanting of West African rituals in which the ancestors 
are appeased and the people who dance do so in costumes and often wearing masks. Masks are forbidden in the new world. They lie behind in savannas of the mind. And what you have in New Orleans alone on the North American continent was this tradition of African people dancing, the sustained impact of dancing Sunday after Sunday across a century. Why was this tradition so deep in New Orleans? Because in the 1740s, the plantation economy was lurching along, and the planters did not generate enough crop, enough food to feed their human property. And so they gave them the leeway to sell whatever they had hunted or cultivated or grown uh, or, or fished. And so this makeshift Sunday marketplace arose behind the rampart or back wall of the town, the site of the present-day uh, Treme neighborhood. So here are these people dancing, and Latrobe gets to New Orleans now after the Louisiana Purchase. It is now an American city. <laughs> but as he learns, uh, and uh, every other major visitor who writes accounts of the city uh, reveals to us during this century of growth, uh, it is a city still, still struggling to find its identity. Is it Spanish? Is it French? What, what is sort of the governing makeup? Uh, the term I use regarding the 20th century is map of the world neighborhoods instead of melting pot, which is a perfectly valid word, term, uh, instead of gumbo, which is the favorite term of certain elected officials. Um, and, and, a, and a perfectly adequate term as well, but to me it is the ethos of these neighborhoods where people from distant points of the globe came and had to forge their lives through folkways of music and adaptability reflected in the food, the cuisine that we have. So all of this is starting to form when Latrobe reaches New Orleans and he makes note of the wild ducks, oysters, poultry of all kinds, fish, bananas, piles of oranges, sugarcane, Irish potatoes, corn, apples, carrots, and all sorts of other roots. So he's just, he's taken in by the exotica of the place. He soon establishes himself, and with his background, with his connections, and certainly with his skills, he is able to generate contracts so he can start work. And in the meantime, he's trying to understand the nature of this place. He gives us some of the best descriptions of the early cemeteries that we have on record. His son Henry was buried in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, the first cemetery that developed across the rampart after the terrible fire and uh, plague that followed in 1788. And yet he says not a word about where Henry is buried. He makes comment about the tomb that he designed for Governor Claiborne, whose uh, first wife had died of yellow fever. In fact, his first wife and his second wife died of yellow fever. Uh, so you read this diary and you realize that although it's a diary, he is also writing for the ages. He is aware that he is kind of a flaneur, as the French would say, a walker in the city. And his viewfinder is giving us, scene by scene, a sense of what this so different, so otherworldly now American place is like. Well, he meets up with a man named Vincent Nolte, a prominent businessman who has uh, made his fortune uh, in New Orleans and had befriended uh, Henry Latrobe. Henry went to the front in the Battle of New Orleans, 1815, uh, and of course Latrobe wants to see the battleground, so Nolte takes him out there. And in all of this, we get no hint from Benjamin Latrobe that his son Henry had a long-standing relationship with a woman of color, and, uh, and they had four children together, one of whom had died. Uh, not to spoil the ending, but it's important to understand that at this point, because as the, as the 
diary moves along and as the chapter begins to build, there's this seed of curiosity that keeps growing. What, what does Latrobe want? What is he really looking for besides prosperity? In my view, he was looking <clears throat> for some connection with his dead son. And the boy, the young man, had died of yellow fever. Well, he establishes himself and he is building the waterworks, the first stage after a great deal of political struggle, struggle lining up the financing. And his, his aristocratic wife uh, from uh, Philadelphia is so taken when she gets off the boat that she walks um, from the dock at uh, St. Louis, well, across from St. Louis Church, and she goes all the way down to the house that they've rented in the Downriver area. And um, she is ready to make a new life. He is building the waterworks. And then he comes down with yellow fever in the middle of the summer of 1820. And in two days, he dies. She is, of course, bereft. And then comes the day. Um, when a young woman of color knocks on the door and the widow opens the door and sees these people and wonders why they were here, and then she learns, well, I was with Henry. These are his children. Now, she was Henry's stepmother, but it's clear from the document that she left that she had no idea that Henry had uh, a paramour of color. It was illegal for him to marry a woman of color. And she was shocked by it. She writes a letter back. It is sort of the custom here. She's taken aback. And so the real question is, why didn't Latrobe tell his wife? What was it that made him keep this secret? Did he feel that somehow there was this disgrace in his family and, and he didn't want to own up to it? Or was it more some sense of betrayal that his son who, remember, was left in England for several years before they made the journey to America and reunited with his father, that his, son, his, father for, his son, for some reason, kept the secret from him. Well, I don't know the answer. But it's one of the questions that kept driving me as I did the research, era by era, to understand how the neighborhoods grew, what the people were like, the terrible burden of slavery. Latrobe gives us one of the best eyewitness accounts of Congo Square. And what is also so interesting about his, his diary, and as I reflect here, he wrote with extraordinary <clears throat> honesty about the cruelty toward African Americans, or African American slaves, I should say. Some of his lines are quite striking. So in a sense, he's a modern man before the modern era and leaves too early. And yellow fever then becomes a scourge that continues. The waterworks never gets built. You know, politically, New Orleans was a disaster uh, for most of the 19th century. I, I know there's some people in Baton Rouge who would say, well, it hadn't changed too much. But, but they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> I live in New Orleans, I know. Um, so I want to do... Uh, a long jump cut across time, given the time that we have, and, and talk about Sister Gertrude Morgan. Remember the theme of the book, culture versus the law, spectacle versus tradition. How does a city change when its popular culture makes these incredible demands of it? The Ring dancers at Congo Square across the 19th century opened out into flowing crowds behind brass bands, which gradually absorbed more and more musicians of color. And by the early 20th century, the tradition of black people dancing behind funeral parades signifies that what has happened is that the linear tradition of European brass band marching to ennoble the dead. And brass bands marched and played for many reasons, but for funerals, they were there to ennoble the prominent dead. And the ring dances of African memory slowly come together. So this 
defining image of the city, the jazz funeral, really represents the coming together of the ring and the line. Well, there are all kinds of accounts uh, of uh, violent altercations, clashes, white thugs throwing bricks at black street dancers. Louis Armstrong gives us some wonderful written reflections on what second lines were like. He grew up as a second liner. So Gertrude Morgan was an evangelist raised in Alabama who comes to New Orleans in 1939, barely literate, and over the next uh, 15 years uh, joins with two other Reverend Mothers in taking in homeless kids. She sings for prisoners in parish prison. Uh, and she is one of those anonymous people in the void of the city when she and uh, the remaining of the two colleagues, Reverend Mothers, Cora Parker, move into a house in the Lower Ninth Ward and there begin proselytizing to neighborhood children. And it is at, at that time that she has a vision that she has, that she is a bride of Christ. Um, she's really a mystic. And I compare her to uh, William Blake and um, St. Catherine of Siena as someone who had a direct relationship with God. It is reflected in, in her poems, which are inscribed on many of the pictures, which now command extremely high prices when you can find them on the market. She's one of the noted folk artists of the American South. And she writes in 1957, he has taken me out of the black robe and crowned me out in white. We are now in Revelation. He married me. I'm his wife. As she begins to paint, she catches the eye of a guy who, you know, when you, when you write nonfiction, when you, when you write narrative history, and yes, I'm guilty. I have published a novel before. Um, there, there are certain characters who just come toward you and, and you want to get out on your knees and light a candle and say thank you for giving me this person. Larry Bornstein is one of them. Larry Bornstein uh, grew up in Milwaukee uh, in the heart of the depression. He is making money selling magazines. As he once told a friend, the sound of money is like a Jewish xylophone. He made money at everything he set out to do. And when we meet him, just before he and Gertrude have that fateful intersection, he has uh, just gotten out of uh, jail in Mexico for the third time, where he was arrested for trying to uh, ferret out antiquities, and he had to bribe his way to get back into the country. And he admits all of this in a, an interview in 1973 to a guy named Tom Bethel. Uh, I haven't seen him in years. He used to write for the Washington Star after he left New Orleans. But anyway, so here, here is... Here is Larry Borenstein, you know, with a cigarette dangling, a kind of T-shirt, a bit of a paunch, and he's sitting there and he's watching this woman bang on her tambourine. And she's singing to the Lord, and she's got these pictures. And he starts looking at the pictures. And the wheels are turning, and he goes up to her and basically says, look, you know, I, I think maybe I can help you with, with, with what you're doing. And so he begins representing her. And... She is there, present at the creation, as Preservation Hall begins to resurrect the traditional idiom in the 1960s, in 1960. She's there as the Freedom Riders are coming into New Orleans with all of these convulsions, and the city, the officialdom in its lurching way, is trying to figure out what to do when David Brinkley comes to town with a camera crew from NBC and does a piece on Preservation Hall, and there is Alan Jaffe who is the tuba player, like Larry Borenstein, a good Jewish boy from up north. He is now taking over the hall with his wife, Sandy. And boom, on NBC News, there's a white guy sitting in with a black band in violation of the segregation laws. So this whole idea of culture and law is now moving toward a thresh, moving toward a, 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 a critical point, like tectonic plates grinding beneath the earth. The same thing that happens 
when Mayor Landrieu takes down the statues. And uh, I, <laughs> I have to make a confession, uh, cards on the table. When Alan Toussaint died in 2015, and there was this beautiful jazz funeral downtown, the, the, the statues were making all of the news. I mean, the preservationists were squawking. The old line traditionalists were mad. All these black supporters of Mitch were, let's do it, let's do it. And a guy named Glenn David Andrews, who is a trumpet player, and he is one of 17 people in his family named Glenn Andrews. <laughs> this is something out of G Garcia Marquez and uh, dynastic lineage like this. And he does a tweet. Take Robert E. Lee down, replace Lee Circle with Two Cent Circle, honor our hero. And all of a sudden, your correspondent looked up and said, aha, I have the opening scene of my book. Here is culture versus, uh, versus the law. Um, so back to the 1960s, there is a gay culture that had been very repressed, where they were paying bribes to the cops so that the, the uh, bars in the French Quarter where gay men went would be left alone and people wouldn't be, you know, beaten. So as, as the city realizes it, it has to adjust to what the New South is becoming to allow black and white musicians to play together and black people to sit with white people in clubs like Preservation Hall, ergo restaurants, ergo airports, and everything else. So the gay community at the same time takes a cue, if you will, from what this Baroque carnival culture has done. And instead of being arrested in their extravagant costumes on carnival, they rent an auditorium and have a big ball and hire police as security the way Rex Comus and the old line crews have done. And in due course, both the upward movement of African Americans into the social and cultural mainstream uh, follows soon along with uh, the presence of, of gay people and a gay community that in its own way was pushing against this legal apparatus for its own freedom. And Gertrude Morgan, through all of that, was painting scenes from the Book of Revelation, the great work of the apocalypse. Uh, written by John of Patmos, uh, I think it was in the fourth century. And what you see are these, I, I find them stunning, scenes of choirs. Jesus is my airplane is one of her scenes. And her savior is not one who is lashing down the word of the law, but rather proclaiming the universality of love. And that becomes her theme. And then finally, she says one day to Borenstein, and, 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 and look, stepping aside from the writer of history, the, if it was a scene in a movie, <laughs> she would say, Mr. Larry, I think I'm just not going to paint anymore. What do you mean? I can't paint anymore. Well, we're, we're selling all your paintings. Why? The Lord told me not to. So I just want to read one quick passage, and then I'm going to show a scene of the film. Because as a mystic, it all makes sense. With all the poems that she puts on the, on the surface of these otherworldly celestial realms, what resolves itself in heaven must resolve itself on earth. The painted world that Sister Gertrude inhabited was purely of her own making, the mystic's dedication to God, making art to glorify him, discovering herself in the process. The autobiographical poems and writings were like her music and sermons, acts of worship to the Lord. The, the mingling of art and personality that gave birth to preservation, excuse me, the meaning the mingling of art and music that gave birth to Preservation Hall echoed a layer of her personality. The hymn that the men's, that's what the old jazz guys call themselves, the men's, played as dirges in the funeral processions are sacred statements. The opposite face on the cultural coin of hot, sexy lyrics of blues and dance tunes. She was there, a presence if not a player, 
as the rebirth of jazz in the 1960s saw segregation shackles fall as music sounded from the dawn of jazz. There is something beautiful about her holy life in that bohemian carnival. Saints are stubborn, notoriously single-minded people. They raise hard questions and refuse easy answers. By the gauge of organized religion, we know perhaps too little to call Sister Gertrude a saint. But the woman who harbored homeless children for nearly two decades after her arrival from Alabama, the missionary who sang for inmates at Parish Prison in the 1940s, and in her last two decades painted a river of images celebrating Jesus as her airplane, was a rare personification of virtue pure, virtue simple, a saintly figure just the same. So I'm right about on time. Um, if you will, uh, uh, just one quick intro. The film has the same title. The film uses burial traditions as a lens on history. The protagonist of the film is Dr. Michael White, the premier clarinetist, and these are scenes. The jazz funeral helps us to transition from death to a new existence, a new spiritual existence. This goes all the way back to Congo Square. The slaves would come on a Sunday from all up and down the river, meet, sing, dance, cry. But the funeral dance is fused with European elements. Brass bands in New Orleans grow out of military tradition. The slaves believed that when they died, they would go back to Africa. Rebirth for new life. I was here about five months when the storm hit. In Texas, I was online scouring for videos, information, any kind of stuff from home. And I was really taken back that there was, I remember there were only like five videos that I could find at the time of uh, Second Line Praise. And one of the things that definitely would have been lost is this tradition. No red lights, no people, Jesus, <sighs> like the city is dead. I don't know if I should pray before or after I go in. Like of a water line. It's disintegrated. my books, and much of my research. Jazz biographies. Everybody from Buddy Bolden to Louis Armstrong to Thelonious Monk to John Coltrane to Josephine Baker to Bessie Smith to George Lewis. Historic picture of Papa John Joseph disappeared. The first published essay I ever wrote was on him. Wherever you went in the room, those eyes would follow you. <laughs> he died in 1900. 
he had that look of conviction and no matter what happened, I'd look at that picture and it would give me strength. Over 4,000 CDs in there. Maybe a third of the CDs I had were rare and hard to find. Films too. Let's see, under here somewhere was a box of sheet music. Jolly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, King Oliver, Sidney Bechet, Johnny Dodds. I had all kinds of stuff in this room. An E-flat clarinet that belonged to Paul Barnes. Several clarinets that belonged to Raymond Burke. I don't think I could bear it. Muhammad Ali, knocking out Joe Frazier. Let's see, what was in the VCR? Uh, probably my video of Beyonce. Ah, I hate losing that. <laughs> Old Baptist hymnal. <sighs> Used to learn songs out of this to play. My African American collection, Reconstruction, and they're all gone. 30 years of life. There was really that question on the table are we even going to fund rebuilding New Orleans? And, you know, I was terrified that, you know, the call, the call would be made that we wouldn't. That's the enduring lesson of the jazz funeral. Return again in another life, and it will be better and jubilant. I have to keep remembering that to go on. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of the earth, for another day of life to share with one another. We are indeed family, from Benin, from Congo, from Cote d'Ivoire. We are commemorating what our ancestors did, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to reenact the wonders, the seeds planted in Congo Square. The histories, the music, the wonderful cultures. We ask your blessing because we do this in their ancestral memory. Through you, we love one another. Amen. Informed that we have 11 minutes. <laughs> so far away. Any questions? Yes. Dino. Um, well, I think the future of the city, uh, if the economy uh, continues on a reasonably good course nationally uh, is encouraging because more and more young people are moving there and there is a a better civic ethos than I think we've had 
uh, with an understanding that the, the city must grow uh, and that uh, education is, is of primary importance. All that to the good. I mean, the great question is climate change. Uh, you know, when I was a kid in school, we were taught that the Gulf of Mexico was 90 miles away. I don't know exactly what the latest measurement is, but with the offshore wetlands losing, uh, you know, a football field every hour, we've already lost an area the size of Delaware. It is inevitable that we will be hit with another flood, if not others. Um, and I think land loss is going to be the great struggle of the next couple of decades. Um, there is not a political consensus uh, in Baton Rouge, uh, or certainly not in Washington, on how to deal with this. Uh, I hope that changes. Yes. It really depends on the schools. Um, I think there's a greater understanding since Katrina of uh, stressing the importance of the, the cultural history of the city. Um, one of my hopes is that the film will be shown in all the schools uh, annually after it's done. I, I think the book is probably some high school kids could get it, but it's really more for uh, college age and older. But uh, the curricula uh, seem to be evolving as charter schools become more prominent. Um, beyond that, I really don't have the expertise to give you a, a sophisticated answer. Yes. Why do you think uh, the culture of New Orleans is so self-contained? Why the jazz casinos have not moved beyond the borders of New Orleans to other places where those moments can be celebrated? Richard's question was, um, why is the culture so self-contained? Why don't we see jazz funerals in all, all other parts of the country? And I think the answer it really goes back to Congo Square. The, the tradition of this African ritual psyche is so profound with, with so many different roots, uh, the Mardi Gras Indians being one of them, uh, early jazz being another, that it, it's just not something you sort of export the way you might a, a, a conventional product. Uh, it's the American city with the deepest African identity, but it's also an American city with such a, a rich intersection of, um, well, carnival is almost a metaphor for the city. Uh, I liken carnival to, to a large constellation of identity pageants from the aristocracy, the balls of Rex and Comus and the others, on down to the crew of Zulu, which started in 1913 as a satire of Rex and is now a cultural power powerhouse with white politicians joining because it's a black majority city. So as these identity pageants ebb and flow, um, I, I think the city acquires a deeper sense of its own uh, identity. Yeah. So the um, people who did uh, Treme, the HBO series, yeah. He asked about uh, Treme, the HBO series. I mean, because they weren't from New Orleans is really not, I don't think, an issue. Uh, David Simon is a brilliant filmmaker, and Eric Overmeyer, uh, you know, his colleague on it. Uh, and for the record, I did not work on it, so I can speak objectively. Uh, but, you know, it was a love poem to the city. I mean, these guys loved New Orleans, and that came through. My opinion is that there were too many overlapping narratives typically five or six, and I think if they had focused on maybe three or four, it would have been a, a tighter uh, program. I do think they caught a lot of the, of the cultural essence. Uh, there was a little inside baseball to it. Uh, the best scene for me was when Irma Thomas, the singer, sits down with uh, Lloyd Price, Laudie Miss Claudie, Art Neville, all these old R&B players, and she takes the money and wins the poker game. So. <laughs> uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it. I don't think it rose to the brilliance of The Wire, his his previous work. But I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah.
Right. He asked about gentrification, which is a, a, a real factor. Um, well, the city council is moving toward tighter regulations for Airbnbs, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, don't under, I, I don't know what the legal restraints would be on people coming in, buying places in order to simply rent them out. They, in essence, then become hotels. Uh, better regulation in that sense would be one, but a greater effort for affordable mortgages to allow people to live in these neighborhoods rather than be displaced would be another. You know, one of the myths about the Lower Ninth Ward, which has been just is pockmarked now uh, because of the terrible devastation and flooding, is that, that it was only poor. And it had the highest level of home ownership, uh, ironically, because many of the houses were inhabited by people of two and three generations who had simply inherited those homes but hadn't kept up with insurance. So they didn't have policies in place to come back and help them to start rebuild. But I, I, you know, I think the more th home affordability uh, becomes a policy, uh, the better the chances of staving off the, you know, the kind of gentrification that I don't think anybody really wants to see. Yep. Yes, ma'am. You know, she asked about Mitch Landrew, how well was he received in the monuments, with the monuments, and what is his future? Well, I, I have to make a confession. I helped him with his memoir, so he hired me, and uh, I, we've been friends for a long time, not, not close friends, but, but friends, and I liked him. I, I appreciated uh, his policies. Um, there was a, a negative reaction among some of the preservationists, and there are certainly some people who still consider Moon a communist who would never vote for Mitch. But um, by and large, I, th I think what is settling in now is a realization that it has been done. How do we move forward? Um, to back up for just one moment, what made his decision so um, effective if you compare, say, Virginia, where the legislature has to give permission to do anything to the statues on, you know, the Monument Drive. Um, uh, New Orleans, the city of New Orleans erected those four monuments uh, in the 1890s into the early 1900s, and it did so without a referendum uh, or even a vote of the city council. It just went up because the mayor, himself a Confederate veteran, one of the early mayors, uh, decided that they wanted to do it. So in a sense, that gave the, um, that gave sort of the authority by statute to the present day mayor. What a mayor of yesteryear took down, today's mayor, uh, put up, today's mayor can take down. I don't really know whether he is going to run. Uh, I'm not part of his inner circle. Uh, as I say, we're on good terms, but um, I think if he were to run, he would be a very formidable candidate for two reasons. Of all the people I see lining up among the Democrats and whoever may run on the Republican side, he's the only one who can lay claim to rebuilding an American city, and he did that. He did it very well. And he did it with strong support from the federal government. Look, in an age of climate change, the federal government is either going to stand aside, as Trump did uh, when Puerto Rico was hit so badly, or it is going to have to develop some sort of policy to intervene after cities or communities are ravaged by these uh, storms. So I think all that to the good. Uh, running as a person who has rebuilt a city will give him um, substantial credibility. I think he'll have, he would have strong support among African Americans. But he's also got something else. The guy's got charisma to burn. He is an extraordinary public speaker and smart and turns on a dime. So right now he is saying, not at this time. I mean, 
<laughs> the cat and mouse game with the media. So I hope he runs. I don't know if he will. We're done? Well, thank you. Thank you.